for everyone jumping on, we're just going to give it a, a couple of minutes just to make sure everybody has a chance to get into the, the room here. Um, so just bear with us. Just about another minute and then we'll get started. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. So um, Welcome everybody to today's program. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the holidays today. Mostly high holidays, a little bit of Passover in there because we found some clips that we just couldn't resist. Um, so I'm Alicia Babstein. I'm the archivist here at OJMCHE and I'm joined today by Judy Margles, our director, and Anne Levant Prawl, our curator of collections. Uh, as always, you will be in good hands. They're going to walk you through all of this and talk about the clips and give you some details and, and fabulous information about the holidays and, and the ways that um, folks here in Portland and Oregon celebrated and observed. Uh, we have more clear clips this time than usual, but a couple are still on the harder side to hear. We've got the volume up as high as it will go. Uh, so bear with us if a couple of them are a little, you know, they're from the 70s, some of them, so they're a little more dull, but hopefully uh, you can hear everything nice and clear. Uh, this is being recorded, so if anybody would like to watch it later or share with friends, please feel free. Um, and we may go over into the one o'clock hour by 10 minutes or so, so feel free to stay on with us if that's the case. And if you have to jump off at the top of the hour, that's just fine too. Um, and the Q&A is open, so if you have comments or questions, please go ahead and use the Q&A, or you can use the chat section as well, and Amber will be monitoring that for us. So with that, we will get started. I'm going to hand it over to Judy. Thank you, Alicia. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I think the very first thing we need to do is it's so hard on Zoom because we can't all clap, but we do have to acknowledge Alicia and the work that she put into this. Anne and I just come along and take the clips and say a few things. Alicia does all the heavy lifting by making the clips for us, actually choosing the people. So kudos to Alicia for a once again, a really superb job. So we are here to talk about Jewish holidays. I think it's very much on all our minds, but we're gonna get the worst over with first, as you can see by the first slide, um, attending Zoom services is not uh, a distant memory for any of us, but we are now in a period, I, I believe in Oregon this year, all synagogues are offering in-person services. But I think it's really important for us to listen to a, a, a few reflections of what it was like to actually be a rabbi and do online services, be a lay uh, leader musician and do online services, and then a congregant. So the first two clips you're going to listen to, the first is Rabbi Rachel Joseph from Congregation Beth Israel. She'll just be reflecting on what it was like to lead services on Zoom. The next clip is from Beth Hammond, who is a um, spiritual uh, traveling prayer leader. She is a Jewish musician and singer songwriter in Portland. She also is reflecting on what it was like to be singing online. So Alicia, let's go with those first two clips first, please. And what was it like to prepare for the high holidays uh, all remotely? It's horrible. <laughs> as I joke, as we all joke, right? They didn't teach us this in school. Um, and, you know, I mean, all the technical stuff, it's just so outside my scope, horrible and hard and all that. But there are people that like it more than others. Um, and, and having a little bit more of a tech background and a theater background and a lighting background. Um, but for me, you know, it was very hard. And um, and also extended the holidays to like six months. I mean, we worked on the holidays from May until September and that's ridiculous. So they're always hard. <laughs> 
but trying to figure out how to do this um, all remotely was just a whole other piece. And then super bizarre to be then on the actual high holidays to be home. I mean, you know, my first time home for a uh, Col Nidre dinner in, I don't know, um, and amazing that you could watch services around the world and, and sort of see, you know, what other people are doing and, and check in. But, um, but it was really hard. So that all the technical stuff, I mean, just exhausting, difficult, all that. And for those of us that go into this because we want to be with people <laughs> and as an extrovert and a people person, um, you know, it's totally miserable not to see people, you know, it's incredibly lonely and I'm feeling the same, you know, isolation that you're feeling and other people are feeling. And that's really, that's really hard is, um, that the whole, you know, so much of it is who do you run into in the hallway and the bathroom and outside and all of that and just catching up. It's the reunion. So not having that reunion. Let me tell you, leading High Holy Days music online is hard. I bet. It is so hard. It is so draining. You mm -hmm. use every ounce of your soul and your energy to, to try and, and facilitate what's supposed to be the most powerful spiritual experience of the year yeah. for people. And suddenly it's just you in a room with a computer and you're just going, Oh, man, this is so hard. Yeah. But so in 2021, when I was able to go up and be in person with the rabbi, it, it made a huge difference. And, you know, I think what's going to happen is as we get a handle on this and we learn more about the virus, some parts of our lives will come back in dribs and drabs. Mm -hmm. And there may be a bit of a roller coaster while we figure this out. The virus is adapting too, remember? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've already adapted in some amazing ways that allow us to sustain connection and Jewish continuity. Well, I think you saw the theme running through there. I think the, the operative word was hard and difficult, but now we're gonna to turn to Judith Raskin. Judith is in lives in Eugene, teaches at the University of Oregon, and she's coming at it from the perspective of a congregant. And I would imagine some of you have had the same experience that you're gonna hear from Judith, where it was actually, there was, there was a silver lining to attend services online. As you'll hear her say, she went to a, a number of different synagogues in different locations. So Alicia, um, run that clip. So for Rosh Hashanah, you know, like I'm the kind of person who goes, find my friends, we chit chat, you know. Uh, and so I have been able to go to services in different places. Like my friend Lizzie, who lives in New York, she belongs to a congregation there that's fun. And so I'll zoom into her congregation and we'll talk on the phone during the like talk out loud during services, you know, you know, like, don't you love this song or whatever, you know, and so that's fun. And so for Rosh Hashanah, my daughter and her new friends zoomed into yeah. our service, which was so fun because she was introducing, you know, her rabbi to her friend. But then the next day they went to Ikar, which is in Los Angeles. And I didn't know about it. And it's, you know, a super LA congregation, you know, with like lots of industry people in it and flashy and, you know, exciting. And so I went with her to that. So that was fun. You know, like I got to see that. I was kind of toggling between this flashy fun service with you know the guy who asked for money which we don't ask for money on Yom Kippur or whatever it was um he was the voice for Olaf in Frozen you know like they had all those kind of people and and then they had you know they had a fantastic um Yom Kippur afternoon where you go onto the screen and there's like a living room and a conservatory and you click on it and in the living room, there are four conversations that you can join with the famous people around racial justice and or in the conservatory, there was music. And so I thought, oh, this will take me like months to go through all this. And it was really fabulous stuff. But then I would toggle, go back to my friendly little shtetl service, you know, where like I know the people and it's so earnest and honest and, you know, like, you know, I really appreciated it. So in, in that regard, this was, although, you know, there was no on a dinner and there was no breakfast and all that. It was novel enough yeah. that it was fun. Anne, I'll pass it to you. Thank you. 
Oh, great. Well, I'm that that experience that Judith is talking about is um, perhaps exaggerated by by doing things on Zoom and doing and during the pandemic, but it's an experience that's been going on forever. Um, we have always always done synagogue hopping and and gone to see how how things are in the shul down the street and these next two clips that we're going to um that we're going to hear are from men who grew up with their parents in one shul and their grandparents in another and it was a very common experience from in our oral histories that children would go to morning services with their parents and then in the afternoons they would go to south portland where where there were five synagogues all all in the neighborhood and and either go around to all of those synagogues or go to where their grandparents were um and let's see first we have arnold labby who grew up in um going to beth israel and then his parents took him to sherry torah actually i think both of these men um went there went themselves with their parents to Beth Israel a reform synagogue and then in the afternoon they went to where their grandparents were at Sherry Torah which was a conservative a conservative leaning orthodox synagogue um so let's go ahead and hear and in in this one Arnold talks about Sherry Torah as the first street shul which is what the people in in South Portland called it do you recall attending services there? Yes, because on the high holy days, we would go to Beth Israel and services would be out because we would go to children's services. And Rabbi Berkowitz was wise enough not to make them too long. <laughs> and so uh, then our parents would take us over to have lunch at Grandma and Grandpa's house at 921 College Street, which is now the athletic pavilion for Portland State. <laughs> And it was just across the street from Shattuck School, mm -hmm. uh, across the park. And then after lunch, we would go to see Grandpa at the First Street Shul. And there he was, uh, all decked out in his white robe, so a religious garment of some kind, and uh, right down front with all the old boys. And he would come out. My mother would have to go upstairs and tell us to sit in the back and grandpa would find us and come and, and he would eternally be blessing us and kissing us on top of the head and he was very observant they belong to, mm -hmm. to both uh, do you know if, if there were ever hard feelings between the synagogues on that or uh, was not, it pretty common for people to be in two places at once? my guess it was fairly common uh, Again, going back to dad growing up, they belonged to Nevisetic, but here's this transition to temple also. Mm -hmm. So, And uh, I felt comfortable um, when I was a kid being mostly at temple and getting my Jewish background there, but also at Shara Torah. Mm -hmm. um, old enough to, you know, my grandmother lived to 90 some odd years so she um, made sure that we celebrated the holidays uh, I mean coming up on Rosh Hashanah you know they she did the dinner uh, at her apartment in a kitchen maybe a little bit bigger than this room and she would have uh, both sides of the family for uh, Rosh Hashanah for breakfast on Yom Kippur um, Passover, uh, both satyrs were at the apartment and uh, she turned the kitchen over. Uh, she kept a, a kosher home uh, throughout her, her life. Mm -hmm. um, um, now we're going to change direction just a little bit and think about um, the the difficulty that there can be in doing that shul hopping at the high holidays during during the rest of the year it's not a problem but during the high holidays traditionally um, the uh, attendance has been regulated by selling tickets to non-members 
to come to services. So it's a little harder to get in. But what these um, children experienced was, was a wonderful thing, getting to go from, from one tradition to another and learn the different ways that things are done. In the 1970s, when Havara Shalom broke away from Congregation Beth Israel, they wanted to do it differently and they did not sell tickets. They did not limit attendance at their high holiday services just to their own membership, but opened it to the whole community. And in that way, um, and you can see the picture down below of the happy dancing people that would be at that, at that service. Um, other synagogues in the area have joined them and are joining them and making, making services more accessible to, to people who are not members of, of synagogues and to people who are members of other synagogues who want to see how things are. So we're going to hear from Carol Chesler, who was a very early member of Congregation Havara Shalom. Alan Berg probably did the most remarkable thing or the most memorable thing he could have ever done for us because he insisted that we plan high holidays, not just for our, we, were, we had grown to maybe 35 families or 50 families by then, but no. He said we had to have a huge, big, open to the community celebration of the high holidays. And he said, you just have to do it this way. And he was absolutely right. And he, he set us on that path. And that has been one of the major legs of our existence. Over the years, it has been the um, entryway for people who were maybe not sure or were looking around or weren't quite ready to commit, but to come to our high holidays and not have to buy tickets and not have to make a commitment, that was brilliant on his part. And we thought, you know, I can remember in the beginning, we argued with him because we thought he was crazy. We could never pull something that, like that off, but we did. Um, so continuing along with the theme of where to pray, um, we have many choices in Portland and all over the, all over the state, there are more and more um, places to have services, um, but in the old days and continuing today in some places, it's hard to have services if you live in a small community, uh, maybe a small community that has a synagogue that doesn't have a rabbi, or a small community that is not even big enough to have uh, to have a, a congregation at all. Uh, we have stories of people traveling up every year from Medford and coming in from Baker City and from places in Washington State, um, coming in from the coast to, to be with family and with congregations in Portland. And we're going to hear two quotes coming up, one quote coming up. We're going to hear Sharon Tarlow and Leo Adler. And Sharon Tarlow grew up in Longview, Washington and came into Portland for some services, but also as you'll hear, um, they had services there as well. Leo Adler was a longtime Baker City resident and he talks about what it was to have services in that small town where they had itinerant rabbis. <laughs> did, did you, as many people did, keep kosher at home but not on vacation no. or just never? No, we didn't keep kosher at all. It, my, my mother really wanted to um, be more reformed than, than she was growing up. And my dad went along with it and it, and it worked for Longview. We did belong to Temple in Portland from the time I was about 10 years old. I didn't go to Sunday school there, but we went for high holidays and stayed in a hotel. And for Jewish holidays sometimes in Longview, they would rent a rabbi, which a lot of small towns do. And for the 10 or 12 or 15 people 
that would attend. My mother just had a fit because it was always so orthodox. And, and none of us could understand the thing that was going on. So um, that spurred her on to have us join Temple. Well, I'm very much interested in the Jewish community because with t over 20 families, do they ever discuss building a synagogue or bringing a teacher in? No, what we used to do, uh, we used to have services. and. and uh, once in a while, a rabbi would come from Boise, but now they don't even have a, a regular rabbi. A city of 100,000. And uh, then my brother, we, we appeared with two holidays, and uh, my brother would read, but the last few years, uh, they had done away with that, and usually Miss Bear, my brother, and my brother's wife, although who's not Jewish, we would go down to his house and uh, uh, read the, the services. Was this for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? Yes, that's right. Uh, did you go into Portland ever for the, for the holidays? Maybe a dozen times in my life, yes. Mm -hmm. And we went over Boise, well, maybe 15 or 20 times. I see. Was it a long, hard trip to Portland in the early days? Oh, yes. The train took about 18 hours, and if you'd drive, you'd have to stay at Pendleton or Beecham or someplace. You couldn't make it one day. <clears throat> so I'm going to um, step back in and, and kind of really con um, continue the theme that Anne was talking about, sort of, and, and looking a little more specifically at the different denominations and what goes on in each individual synagogue. Once a year, I try and tell a joke. It's a joke everybody's heard of, but I thought of it when I was thinking about all these clips we're doing. You know, of course, that joke, the traditional, the Jewish, uh, the religious man ship or the religious person shipwrecked on a desert island, right? His rescuers come to find him a couple of years later, and he has three huts built. Everybody knows this joke, right? One hut is his home. The other hut is the synagogue he goes to. The third hut is the synagogue he wouldn't step foot in, right? And and you see this in, in um, you know, in very humorous ways in the way that people who have uh, done oral histories are talking about other synagogues. And it's always it's always in a very um, lovely tone of voice. It's not snippy. That being said, of course, I think for many of certainly my parents' generation, um, hearing them talk after going to synagogue, particularly on the high holidays, a lot of the, I hate to use the word gossip or Lashon Hora, but you know, they were chatting about their friends and family and what people were wearing and what the rabbi's drosh was and right? Um, and I always like to mention if uh, those of you who know in Portland, the Sephardic Synagogue of Arachim, which had been for some years from the 60s through till the, the early part of the 2000s, located on Barber Boulevard in this beautiful synagogue shaped like a beehive. Um, it had this kind of pantheon effect where wherever you're sitting, you could be sitting in the front row farthest away from the person in the back row and you could whisper and that could be heard. It was it was the acoustics there. So you had to be careful what, what you were going to be saying. So right now we're just going to listen to um, some clips of community members talking about differing tr traditions and levels of observance between the synagogues. First up, we're going to have Fran Wolf. Um, Fran was born in Utah. She came to Portland when she was 16, attended Beth Israel here in Portland. So Alicia, play Fran, please. Wait, I just want to pop in for a second do. And, and say what's what's cool about the the upcoming uh clips is that we get Fran is is noticing how different it is from her reform Jewish perspective and then the next clip is an orthodox man talking about about differences in traditions from his orthodox clip and I love that that we are exposed to so many different different traditions here um, I think more so in Portland than in other places even. So let's... No, thanks, Anne. And actually, I think, Alicia, just play all three. So Anne mentioned, um, we're going to hear first from, from as I mentioned, uh, Fran Wolf, and then we're going to listen to Bernard Brown, who Anne mentioned, he is Orthodox. Then we're going to hear from Gail Marger. She herself is not 
Sephardic, but she's just doing a recollection about kind of wanting to be Sephardic or how, how to participate in a Sephardic tradition. So let's just roll with all three. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Do you recall going to South Portland? Oh, yes, yes. I would. The wonderful thing when we were, when the High Holy Days would come, there were a group of us, and we would walk from synagogue to synagogue. And uh, so it was fun on uh, uh, Yom Kippur. Do you recall going to... You seem to be off kilter here. It's in the last year, there moved in here three families, which are Shomer Shabbos and Observant. And the only reason they came to this synagogue is because this is the only real Orthodox synagogue which has separate seating and it has a beam in the middle of the synagogue and, and the, for the high holidays when I send out the schedule I have a remark in the bottom ladies are asked to please cover their head which as you know here in Portland, nobody pays attention anymore if the ladies go in with head covered or without covered heads in the synagogue. It's in the last year. And also when I was at her house and we had a Sephardic tradition like for Passover, or Rosh Hashanah or whatever it was, I just assumed every family was like that. That, that there were two days for Rosh Hashanah, so you could go to one side one day and the other side the, the other day. And it never occurred to me I wasn't Sephardic because my cousins were. Mm -hmm. It just was like, okay, when I'm here, I'm Sephardic, but when I'm there, I'm, I'm not. And it was, I don't know at what point where, that it occurred to me that I'm actually, that actually wasn't the truth, you know, but um, it, it, it was, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love if anybody has had that experience, right? I mean, there's, you know, Judaism has a number of denominations and I, I'm put in the chat if you have any stories to share about, to share with us about imagine, you know, going to an Orthodox synagogue perhaps and thinking that is your tradition and then going home and finding out from your parents that no, 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 we, we're not, we don't, um, we don't have that level of observance. So share your stories. And it's back to you. Uh, this next- and also. And I'm sorry, uh, having jumped back a slide, I think it's off kilter now, apologies. So I'm trying to get it squared away. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. We're good. Um, this next clip is from Sonia Lieberman, who is talking about her childhood in Belarus. But she's talking, especially listen to the, to the end of her clip and hear how she talks with such, such reverence about the the bringing out of the special things for the holiday which i thought was it, it's it's a an experience that most of us have had um if you if you celebrate passover in such a way that you bring out out dishes and and linens and things that are only ever seen once a year and have such nostalgic power behind them, which which grandparent made them or brought them into the house. So here's, oh, and then are we, are we, no, then we're going to stop in between. Okay, so here's Sonia Lieberman. All the holiday was celebrated, and always a lot of people, I don't know who the people were, always, every holiday. Uh, Pesach was the most happiest holiday in our home. And it's, I think they started right away, the day after Purim already, uh, feeding the, uh, the geese and the gooses and, and preparing and uh, cleaning and this, but they really what I really ca uh, stuck in my mind, I remember my father used to take three of us upstairs to the uh, attic and used to take out the dishes and just showed us this one's from this Bob, and this one's from this Bob, and that's from your mother's side, uh, relatives, you know. And there were uh, purple glasses, little purple glasses, you know, the special glass, and the spoons were special from there, and the dishes were special from there. It's everything, every cup and every dish of Pesach 
it was a story to it. Mm-hmm. So it was really important. Mm-hmm. Oh, it just occurred to me, she's talking about starting just after Purim to feed the geese so that they can have chopped liver. It's, they're, they're, they're making foie gras. Um, so um, this, we're continuing on with the theme of traditions and how we celebrate Passover. And here is Elaine Kogan, uh, a, a native Portlander, talking about um, their own tradition of creating services uh, I, I I specifically called her out on this one and asked her to donate this to the museum collection because this is what it's all about. This is making the holiday your own and creating new traditions from the old ones. Um, Elaine has a Passover Haggadah that they've put together and also a service for um, for Hanukkah that she has with her children and grandchildren. Um, if, if any buddy who's out there and listening has homemade Passover Haggadahs and homemade other services and traditions of your own that are unique to your house. We want to know about them. So make sure that you that you reach out to us and tell us about them. And would you talk a little about your your um, Haggadah? Oh, <laughs> yes. Well, uh, not only that, we have we have something for Hanukkah too. We have a Hanukkah book it's stable together, it's nothing very elaborate, uh, but there's a different uh, prayer for every night. It was written by Dory Sherry, who was a, a, a Hollywood director, the writer, probably in the 50s. Anyway, I, I got, it was, it was printed by the Rabbinical Council years ago, and so I got a copy of it, and I have since uh, changed it, so that every night, this is the first night, and this candle means, anyway, every night the candle uh, symbolizes something. And we read that every night. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting, I was speaking to somebody recently, or I saw him at a party, and he said, you know, we're still using your Haggadah. So, I'm uh, not Haggadah, the mm-hmm. Hanukkah thing. All right, so well, this is still, you know, my, anytime I have a chance to write something, I write something. So then we have produced our own Haggadah. And uh, we changed, I changed it every year a little bit. Well, you know, there's little <laughs> tweaks here and there. Uh, we threw in the midwives. I don't know if you have the one with the midwives. I don't the know. whole uh, midrash about how the midwives really saved uh, the Jewish babies uh, because they told the Pharaoh's uh, minions uh, that, uh, they, uh, that the Jewish women gave birth too, too quickly. Anyway, whatever it is, there's a little midwife, so we mm-hmm. threw that in. And we also have songs. Um, anyway. I love that interview. Um, and then then there's the extreme end of of being inclusive about your about changing your traditions. You'll hear Gene Noodleman Sr. talking about his family. The, the Noodleman family and the very conservative Grandpa Noodleman. Um, well, I won't ruin it for you. You can listen listen through to the end. I remember seeing in the Noodleman family book pictures of, um, you know, maybe uh, Passover celebrations or um, yes. uh, some kind of get together, and, and the family looked quite big, and it looked like it was. Yeah, well, we uh, we used to go to Grandpa's house, Grandpa Noodleman, for Passover. And uh, he would t- get in as many as he could, and they had a rather large house on Alberta Street. And um, he would, uh, he would, they would prepare the Seder. And uh, uh, I think one of the cute things that happened, I can recall very, very vividly, that Grandpa Noodleman was a great fan of Amos and Andy. And, he had to hear them every night. He'd get his evening prayers in before they came on. Well, we were all there for Seder, and the Seder was going along, and he was watching his watch. And pretty soon he says, okay, we'll stop the Seder. And he said, and my dad said, what for, Pa? He said, because we're going to, we're going to wait until Amos and Andy is over. And sure enough, we had to sit there half an hour while nobody got to eat their you know, dinner or to finish the, the, the service until Amos and Andy was off the radio. So he was... <laughs> So as, uh, you know, as orthodox as he was, he was very liberal and a very understanding man. 
I've certainly heard about Passover seders that have the Ten Commandments running in another room so the children can leave the table and go go watch Charlton Heston, but I had not heard about anybody including Amos and Andy in their service before. Yeah, that, that, that clip is brilliant, right? What, what one does. So let's um, turn a little bit about, for all of us not, we're very fortunate at the Jewish Museum in that we are closed for the high holidays and for the first two days of Passover, but many people are not working in a Jewish world and the holidays come. And we all know, those of us, you know, out in the world, it is sometimes very, very difficult and sometimes very uncomfortable to ask for time off. Um, so, and that has always been the way. So we're going to just go back in time and look at some clips from the, or we're actually going to listen to one clip from the mid 20th century. This is uh, Frances Sch uh, Schnitzer Bricker. She grew up in an observant home in South Portland. She attended congregation Shere Torah. Her father, Moisha, when he came to this country from Eastern Europe, she um, he went into the junk business specifically so that he would be able to take Shabbat off and the holidays. You know, in the early days, Jews were able, particularly those who peddled, we have stories in our oral history collection, Jews peddling, peddling was sort of the the easiest profession for those early immigrants to get into because it helped them acquire the English language. They didn't have to work for other people, but there was that third um, helpful piece of being a peddler in that you could make your own schedule, which was really important. So Alicia, let's let's um, listen to um, Francis Schnitz Schnitzer Bricker and then we'll talk more. So you went to work in the office of the Girl Scouts of America? I did for the last 15 years mm -hmm. that I worked, but before that I went to work other places. Mm -hmm. I started with my brother Barney's place mm -hmm. and uh, worked in other offices for a while. But I always, in the first interview, said there are three days in a year I never work. And that's Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. This was my way of saying I was Jewish, and I would not work on those days in any event. What was the third day? The two days. Oh, of the two days of yes. Uh, and mm -hmm. the Green Chipper. Right. It was my way of saying I was Jewish, mm -hmm. and it was my way of saying also firmly from the beginning that I would work those three days, and it never handicapped me in finding a job. Never. So the next clip, Alicia's going to read. Um, it's from Harry Rubenstein, who was in Medford. He was a merchant in Medford. I'm, I'm so delighted if you listen to Bernard Brown or Sonia Lieberman, and the, the wonderful thing about listening to these oral history clips is we get the accents of people and that's, you know, we're, we're losing that as we move into later, later into the 21st century, of course, we're, we're not able to be around as many people um, who came from the old country and came with these accents. Harry has an incredibly uh, hard accent to listen to, so easier to let Alicia Play the clip. Alicia, play the clip, and then I'll just say a couple of things about it. I'll read the, the clip. Sorry. We used to close on Rosh Hashanah and one day Yom Kippur. So I had a sign. We were open after sunset. At that time, the sun went down at about 6.30 or 7 o'clock. When I came down to the store, there was a line of about 15 or 20 people waiting to get in. So one guy says to me, did you advertise a sale? I say, no, today is Yom Kippur. I said, we had a sign up that we are closed on the Jewish holiday. Then there was one fellow who came over to talk. His name was Applegate from the country. He spent about $300. Then he said to me, we come into Medford 10 o'clock this morning. And I say to my wife, we are going to wait till they open because if they respect their religion and give up the business for a day, we are going to wait. That's quite wonderful, right? Um, the photo actually that you're looking for from is Medford. It's a little later than when Harry uh, was uh, relating his experience. The photo is from 1947, and it actually is the, um, a photograph of the very first service in Medford. But back to Harry's quote, and, and our oral histories are really filled with stories of acceptance, stories of people in the community really showing respect for the Jewish merchants and the Jewish community as um, fragmented and as limited. You know, Harry was 
probably the only Jewish family, Harry and his family, with, were probably the only Jews living in Medford at the time. Can uh, I interrupt for a moment? Yeah, please. Yeah. There, were, there were three. Oh, there were, there okay. were three Jewish families. And what's I was noting while he was speaking that because I mentioned about traveling long distances to celebrate the holidays, almost everyone who, who lived in Medford came up to Portland for the holidays, which was a long trip and they had to plan on spending it. So the fact that he is staying in Medford and putting up a sign that says, I'll be here when I close, that means that he wasn't with community on, on Yom Kippur. He was, he was either alone and his family went up to, to Portland without him or the family all stayed behind and they had to make that decision between between running their business and being with community, which must have been a, a difficult choice right. to make. Yep, yep. So, sort of staying in the same in the same vein. What about going to school? And again, our oral histories have a number of anecdotes within them about kids who were, and again, probably all our experiences, right? Being off for the Jewish holidays for some of us. Oh my gosh, we just couldn't wait not to have to go to school for a couple of days or for any of the holidays. And for some of us, it was like, why do we have to go to school? Why, 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 why do we have to stay home from school? We want to go to school. So we're going to listen to two clips um, about school. Um, let's just play Francis Schnitzer Bricker first, please. Oh. If mm -hmm. we can. I'm Emma Bader Glickman. Oh, I'm on the wrong page. Forgive me. Let me just, yeah, I'm sorry. We're going to hear from Emma Bader Glickman. Um, Emma grew up in South Portland. She attended neighborhood school for kindergarten, then she switched to failing school for elementary school, and then she went to Lincoln. So here's what she remembers about attending school. The uh, principal who had succeeded old man Pratt, Martin Pratt's father, Martin at one time was the sheriff of Multnomah County, was Fanny Porter. And she was quite a famous character most of the pupils in the school were Jewish. My um, mother, not being so observant, actually we were Yom Kippur Jews. We went to the synagogue on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. My, would, my mother would send us to um, school on the non-important holidays like <coughs> Passover or Hanukkah, and the school was empty, so Miss Porter would send us home. <laughs> That's that's quite a memory. And I think I think in other programs, I don't know whether any of you attended and remember, we have talked a fair bit about Miss Porter. She was the quite imposing figure on the photo that Alicia showed us. Um, listening to this story, we we don't have a clip to play, but it did remind us of Richard Matza. Some of you may know Richard. Richard's family, of course, is Sephardic. He attended Avarachim. He has just the most marvelous recollection about wanting to go to synagogue on Rosh Hashanah. I mean, wanting to wanting to go to school on Rosh Hashanah. So I'm just going to, I'll read you this, this clip because we, we don't have it. I remember one year on Rosh Hashanah, I was in bed and my mother came in to say, get ready, we're going to synagogue. And I said, I don't want to go to synagogue. She said, you are going. And I said, I don't want to go. So she said, okay, then you're going to school. So I got dressed and I went to school. There were no Jewish kids in school. I felt so awkward. I was the only Jewish kid in my class that day and the rest of the school day. It was embarrassing. <clears throat> so Richard said that was really his lesson that um, it was important to, to be with your community. He attended a school in South Portland of which there were something like 24% of the kids were Jewish. So predom predominantly Jewish kids that, um, were um, attending the school. So our last clip, we're really uh, moving along here, but our last clip is, is really important because we wanted to just sort of talk a little bit about what it was like and what it is like, I guess, because obviously we have Jewish uh, service people, but what it's like to observe the Jewish holidays while serving in the United States military. Uh, it's it's not easy, right? You ser serving in the military, observing a Jewish life, keeping kosher, attending Shabbat services, celebrating the holidays wasn't always possible. And we have a lot of oral histories that really speak to this in various ways. 
won Second World War veteran Morris Safran. He, he really echoes the sentiments of many people in our oral history when he notes that his faith was probably a factor in strengthening his uh, desire for survival. But we also have lots of stories about the bigotry that soldiers faced. Alvin Rackner served in the Korean War. Um, he is actually in the photo, so the bottom photos to the right, if you see the person with the tallest with his head bowed down, that is Alan at a Rosh Hashanah service. And he, he, um, he said this about uh, trying to be, trying to attend services. Well, training in the 10th Infantry at Fort Riley, Kansas, this was December of 1950. There were five Jewish members of the company. They were denied Christmas holiday passes on the grounds that they didn't need them. The rest of the company were given passes. And I point this out, not, not because he wanted to observe Christmas, clearly not, but because being um, trying to attend synagogue on the Jewish holidays was, was very difficult. And then I always have to talk a little bit about what it was like to um, observe Passover, particularly during the First World War. There's this really marvelous order that uh, General Pershing put forth in February of 1918. Uh, it was in France. He actually delivered the order in France in preparation for anybody wanting to observe Passover. I'll just read you the order. It's, um, it says, for a period of eight days, from March 27th to April 4th, 1918 inclusive, Jewish bread called matzahs or unleavened bread will be issued to the soldiers of the Jewish faith who are members of this command in lieu of the bread component of the ration at the rate of 16 ounces per day to each man. So if you think about 16 ounces of matzah, that is an entire box. So one would hope that the, the soldiers were not eating an entire box of matzah, but they, they might be. And before we hear the clip, the um, last, there, there were a couple of oral histories from women who really, un, women serving in the military, but really um, understood that their place was rather unique. There's a, a woman named Michelle Turner. She was in California during the Vietnam War, War she was serving. And she, she recalled that when she went to um, services, even though the women were sitting separately from the men, she was always invited to sit with the men because she was a soldier first and not a female first. I love that. And then there was Esther Schneeberg. She was a, a WAC in Fent Fort ben Benning, Georgia. And she said that she never, ever met any of the Jewish families in town, but that the Jewish men, the Jewish soldiers, the ma male soldiers were always invited to the homes of, Jew of Jewish community members in Fort Benning, never the Jewish women. And we can just use our imaginations and um, think that, of course, the families were inviting these Jewish men home in the hopes that they would um, be introduced to their daughters and perhaps there would be a shidduch after that. So we are gonna just listen to uh, one last quote from Irv Leopold. Irv actually passed away last year. He was born in Portland. He attended Shattuck School, Lincoln School, and he was in the ar army during the Second World War. So Alicia, play that clip. Did you do anything Jewish during your service? Yeah, I did. I went to High Holidays. Where? In Germany. So was it just for soldiers? Just for soldiers. Do you have any memories of that service and the experience? Yeah, I do. It, it was a little bit different. It wasn't quite as intense Hebrew. I mean, it's more or less a, a combination of English and some Hebrew. And uh, I imagine that in service we would have eight or ten people. Oh, that's it. Yeah. And then we, there was a synagogue in Munich that we went to, as I recall. Yeah. And uh, it was partially destroyed. But still functioning? I don't know what it did beyond the, the high holidays that we, we attended ourselves. So it was conducted by Americans. I see. Yeah, that's a hard one. I would love to jump in right now and and do a little plug for our oral history program and and just say I 
totally love listening to the stories and you can see that that the stories that we clip in each of these episodes of our presentation are little bits that perhaps the person who was being interviewed came into it saying, oh, I don't really have anything to say. I, I don't have a big story to tell. I just have, have my little life that I led. And I want to encourage anybody who's out there who has not come forward and been interviewed or, or God forbid, not been asked yet to be interviewed, come forward, please. And, and your little bit of, of story will add to what we have here, which is the collective experience of the Jews of Oregon. Um, or if you like to, to listen to people, come in and be an interviewer with us. We always need interviewers and we always need transcribers to transcribe those interviews. If right. anybody, that's my plug. Yeah, no, that's done. perfect. And if anybody has any um, uh, questions, you can put them in the chat. We are ending a little early today, which I don't think anybody will mind. We're giving you back a few minutes of your of your day. We're just so grateful you're with us. And uh, our next program is on November 30th. We're going to do it again on November 30th. And we're going to take you on vacation because going on vacations was definitely part of the American dream. And we have many, many stories in our collection about vacations. And if you want to be included in that, we have time to interview you between now and November 30th. And we can get your story about a vacation in too. So we'll, we'll keep the um, Zoom link open just for a couple of minutes, just in case any of you... Um, post any questions, which we are happy to ask. You can also, of course, email us at any time. So thank you. I see that Sandy asked at the very beginning who was in the third photo. Can you go to the third photo, Alicia, and we can see who that is? Is that the... Is, do you think that's the one she meant? Sandy, are you out there? Is that what you wanted to know? I think it wasn't. Keep going. It's There are three photos on a slide. Yeah, that one right there. Oh, I think that's Rabbi Berg. It is. It's Alan Berg. Many years ago. For those of you who celebrate, we just want to wish you a joyous, sweet, happy, peaceful um, holiday. And we look forward to seeing you next time. As I said, if you have questions, put them in there. We'll, we'll stay on for a couple more minutes. But thank you for joining thank us. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. Shana Tova. We'll just be here quiet. <laughs> thank you, Jason. Thanks for everybody posting in the chat. It doesn't look like there are any questions. No. It's so funny for us because we we thought we timed it well and then we clipped along a little faster than we thought. Well, it's just that every time we go over by so much and we don't get to all of the clips that so we we tried to be modest this time. <laughs> really overcompensated. That's fine. I do I want to do a shout out for our dear friend Sylvia Frankel, who is um Zooming in from Israel right now. And for those of you who are still on the Zoom, Sylvia. Hi, Sylvia. <laughs> Hi, she Sylvia. conducted quite a few of those interviews. Quite a few of those interviews. interviews. You could hear her. Sylvia voice. has has the most interviews under her belt from and anybody. She has, I think, about 105 right now. So um, for all of those who haven't been interviewed, um, Sylvia can do it remotely. <laughs> <laughs> Or we can get her back here. All right. I think we're going to hang up, but there, thank there you. is one question that just popped oh, in. Great. They asked, how did, oh, how do we isolate this part of the interview? You asking how we make the clips? Oh, perfect question. <laughs> if that's the question, uh, there's simply an audio editor uh, that I use. It's just taking the full audio file and putting it in there and finding the right spot and trying very hard to get 
all the right words in there. <laughs> yeah, Alicia's underplaying how much work and time she spends on this. Alicia works really, really hard getting these clips prepared for us and making sure that they're even clearer than they than she she works with the audio and makes them as clear as they can possibly be. And of course, I think that the one group of people we didn't really thank, but it goes without saying, everybody who has um, done an oral history for us and is really helping, helping, helping us to understand this community in really important ways. So that's why I think Anne's plug is so important. Get yourself interviewed. We're interested. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye-bye. We'll Bye. -bye.